You're listening to the Ask Drone You podcast. You ask, we answer your drone questions. Whether you're here to turn your passion into profit or you simply fly for fun, we're a community of learners and teachers who aspire to achieve greatness. We are Drone You. Hey everyone, and welcome to another fantastic episode of Ask Drone You. We're gonna be bringing you the drone news this week, thanks to Drone DJ. Hiya, welcome to the show, my friend. How are you doing? Very good, Paul. Thank you. How are you doing today? Doing very good. Energized unusually without the use of coffee. So very excited Ah. for today. Let me know how you pulled that one off. Uh, It probably won't last very long, so I'll be hitting Ah. the coffee uh, rack here very soon. But I'm very excited for this show because it seems like there's some really, really astounding news in the development of the Phantom series. And we're not just talking about the Phantom 4 Pro, we're talking about the Phantom 4 Pro version 2 as well. So what do you have for us, Haya? We discovered earlier this week um, that the Phantom 4 Pro now officially is no longer in production. If you go to the DJI website, you go to the Phantom 4 section and you look for the Pro, you get a pop-up screen that says, literally says, the Phantom 4 Pro is no longer in production for the latest in DJI technology. Please view our product recommendations below. And below they show an image of a Mavic 2 Pro. Now, of course, we already knew that the Phantom 4 Pro version 2 was out of stock since early November last year. So that's been months already. However, now the regular Phantom 4 Pro is not even in production anymore. Now, this, of course, brings up all kinds of questions and speculation like, as to why this is happening. Could it be related to the fraud case that DJI is dealing with, that some of their suppliers uh, are no longer working with DJI because they've been kicked out? Potentially, uh, I think that might be part of it. Of course, the far more interesting reason could be that they're working on a Phantom 5 and hopefully they will be releasing that later this spring or maybe early this summer. So we'll have to see what happens there. I think it's very interesting. I've been watching a lot of the uh, commercial SUAS group on Facebook and noticing that a lot of people do agree with your article that maybe the um, the fast, uh, how do I say this, the ending of the production line with the Phantom could be a factor of the $150 million fraud case. Because again, if you're cutting money off the top in supplies, you know, from suppliers and you're no longer utilizing those suppliers, it definitely makes sense. Now it's yeah. interesting if they do come out with the Phantom 5, do you believe that they will kind of follow the historical or recent historical trend and launch maybe two Phantoms like they did with the Mavic series because even with the Phantom 3, right? We had the Phantom 3 Pro, the Phantom 3 Advance. Do you think we're going to see a Phantom 5 Zoom and maybe a Phantom 5 with uh, like those interchangeable lenses that was just spreading all over the internet? I think so. I mean, uh, DJI always had uh, multiple versions of drones, starting with the uh, the Phantom, and then with the Mavic 2, of course, they had uh, the Zoom and the Pro version. Uh, what we've been hearing is that there will be indeed two uh, Phantom 5s. One will have a um, zoom lens, and the more expensive one would have interchangeable lenses. Uh, price range would be around $1,800 for the Phantom uh, 5, and then for the pro version, it could go up to like 24, 2500 even. Uh, and I assume that would include all the different lenses. Uh, there would likely be four different lenses. Uh, but of course, these are all rumors, so we don't know quite sure yet. I would also be very shocked if they did not use a Hasselblad camera in, uh, yeah. in, in, in at least the pro, you know? Yeah, the pro model should be uh, branded Hasselblads, and uh, what we've heard is that there would be four prime lenses, starting with a 16 mil, 24 mil, 35, and then a 50 mil lens. And I would imagine that they would all be branded Hasselblads, and you get that color science that uh, Hasselblad is known for. Yeah, more expensive than the previous Phantom for sure. Um, I do think though, if they get their stuff uh, in order this time and we get the video uh, quality that we're looking for and a global shutter that we all want, then I think the Phantom 5 could be uh, could be a real success. I think it could also be a real success in the industrial space as more and more, it seems like more and more industrial enterprise users are just realizing that they need a drone that can consistently operate. And I'm seeing and yeah. hearing of multiple of our clients deciding, you know, we're using Phantoms or Inspires, we're not gonna be using these bigger rigs that are a lot less reliable. So it's it's very interesting, but it also seems like there is another new development from a new player in the drone market. Someone from the United States is developing something that could 
seriously compete. But instead of designing the drone around the frame and the camera, it seems like this drone is actually designed around the battery. What do you have for us? Yeah, this is a really interesting drone. It's made by Impossible Aerospace, and the guy behind it, his name is Spencer Gore. He was a battery uh, engineer from Tesla. And if I'm correct, he left Tesla back in 2016 to start Impossible Aerospace. They recently picked up uh, funding as well, and they launched a drone where the battery cells are actually uh, 90% of the drone, it seems. It forms the structure of the drone. It's a quadcopter design. It's much bigger. It's 26 by 26 inches. It's also quite a bit heavier. I think it's around 16 pounds. So we're talking a serious uh, size drone. However, if it uh, flies without a payload, it can stay up in the air uh, up to two hours, which of course is incredibly long. There's no tethering system, it's just battery powered. It can carry payloads up to three pounds. It doesn't come with a camera or a thermal camera, so you have to buy that in addition to the uh, quite expensive drone. The uh, US-1 drone, as they call it, uh, I think sells around 7,000 bucks. So it's not a cheap drone at all. Uh, It's not quite meant for consumers. It's more geared towards commercial applications and specifically to firefighters, uh, emergency responders, police departments. And um, about a month ago in California, a SWAT team actually used this drone to assist in one of their operations. And um, they later commented that having the drone up in the air for that long gave them much more intelligence because, of course, it gives them a higher vantage point and they were able to adjust their operation and uh, successfully finish that uh, with help of the drone. So I guess the US-1 already proved its uh, its its point. Um, it's a heavy drone. It's, it's an expensive drone. But yeah, they're onto something for sure. Wow. Yeah, that is fascinating. I think it could be great for crowd monitoring and public safety, like you right. said, but it's going to be interesting to see how it operates. And it's going to yeah. be interesting to see, you know, how it's accepted by the community as a whole. Now, yeah. while that drone is still yet to be accepted in the community, there is another drone that has already been accepted by many. And I have to say, Haya, it's now one of my favorite drones. I don't know if you've been watching my Instagram story, but I've been seeing aliens flying real low along the beach. And it just ended <laughs> up being me flying a Mavic Enterprise. So, what what are I, I mean I, we talked about creative uses for the Mavic Enterprise before, but what do you have for us? Yeah, this is an interesting story. Uh, uh, farmers in Australia are using uh, the Mavic Two Enterprise with the loudspeaker to herd sheep, and of course. <laughs> <laughs> so what they've done is they recorded the bark uh, and the sound of a dog and then they fly the drone towards the sheep and they bark at the sheep and then of course they run wherever they, they need to be sent to. Um, Herding the, sheep dogs yeah. everywhere have lost their jobs. <laughs> uh, pretty much. If, if I was a dog, I'd be heavily concerned about my career right now. But <laughs> <laughs> they say that uh, the drone actually works more effectively than a dog um, because some of the sheep, especially the older ones, they, they try to stand up towards dogs. So they don't always listen to dogs, whereas the drones are so unnatural to them and they don't always see the drone. Uh, they, of course, make the buzzing sound as well. So apparently the sheep respond much better. And these farmers really got creative. They have like siren sounds and like Star Wars uh, soundtracks that they use to guide their sheep. Wow. So <laughs> it, it's getting a little weird. But it <laughs> the, the farmers did have one thing to say, though, that um, the dogs should not uh, fear losing their jobs quite yet. Because, of course, dogs operate much better in uh, inclement weather conditions. And they don't have a short lifespan of only 20, 25 minutes like the drones have. So I think the dogs are still safe, but it's uh, it's cool to see what the farmers are up to. The dog union they... can now call off the strike for the dogs. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think they're good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would say it seems like more people are finding new innovative ways yeah. to enjoy their jobs. And this is just one fantastic story of how people are yeah. doing that. Unfortunately, though, it looks like while some other people were trying to have fun with their drone, they got stuck in quite a predicament. Um, And it seems like we may have had one of our first casualties in the drone industry. What happened here, Haya? Uh, This took place in Forest Park, Georgia, about a week ago on Saturday evening. Uh, It's a very unfortunate story. There it was. Um, one man flying a drone, the drone got caught in a tree. His brother came home from work, decided to help his younger brother to retrieve the drone. 
Um, and they used the pole to kind of try to get the drone out of the branches where it was stuck. And inadvertently, he hit one of the power lines with that same pole. And it was a life uh, line. So he got pretty much electrocuted. Uh, his brother flew through the air. He flew through the air. Um, when the police arrived, they tried to revive him. Uh, he was taken to the hospital right away. But unfortunately, he didn't make it. So... Uh, it wasn't caused by the drone necessarily, but in an effort to retrieve the drone from the tree, they touched that power line, and yeah, that was it. So it, it is very unfortunate. Yeah, it is unfortunate. Uh, yeah. When I first read this story, I thought it was more of a story of someone getting hurt from retrieving their drone because it was like shot down, and I was actually relieved yeah. uh, to hear that uh, it was more of an accident, although still extremely unfortunate, and our yeah. thoughts and prayers go out to the family. but. Yeah. Before we end this rather fast news show that we're going through this week, it looks like there may be one last good news, a, uh, a drone boost, as you would call it, as yeah. drones are helping find little cuddly creatures to help us all feel a little bit better. A little better. We're going to end this one on, uh, on a positive note, right? So... Uh, this goes back to Australia again. This is the Queensland. Those Aussies are having way too much fun. Oh man, they're they're ahead of the game. <laughs> we got to step it up here in the US, I think. <laughs> hey, well, hey, let's get together. Come to the Southwest. Weather's beautiful. Come fly, and we'll we'll herd some sheep. We'll look for some koalas. Whatever makes you happy. I'll, I'm, I'm your man. Uh, I'll be right over. <laughs> So this took place in uh, Queensland University of Technology. These guys uh, use drones with thermal cameras to count and monitor koala bears. And koala bears, of course, they climb into trees and those trees carry quite some, some leaves. So uh, they're hard to spot. And typically people have been, or researchers have been walking through these forests and looking up uh, into the trees to try and spot koala bears. Now, you can imagine that's time consuming, it's tedious. It takes probably forever to find these bears because they're uh, pretty well camouflaged. Uh, so now they're using drones. Uh, the problem before, though, was that, of course, the, the canopy of those trees make it very hard to monitor and view these uh, these little bears uh, from the top down. So the, what they've done is they've used thermal cameras and they launched these drones with these thermal cameras early in the day when the temperature differences are the biggest between the environment and these bears. And sure enough, those bears stand out like sore thumbs. So now all of a sudden they're easy to count. And we've seen this also happen in, in different wildlife research areas uh, where they've used drones as well. But this has been a breakthrough and uh, the drones proved to be faster, more accurate. And yeah, they still use human um, researchers to, to count bears as well, but more so to um, to make sure that the drone results add up. So it's more like a control system, basically. But the drones are able to count them much faster, for sure. Well, I think it's a, it's a good message for everyone, especially in Florida, where there are wildlife conservancies and people are worried about yeah. flying drones around. It's like, guys, you really need to do your research and understand the technology before yeah. you make a decision based out of fear. Because if other conservation agencies are actively using drones in close proximity to trees to pick up a koala on a 640p camera with thermal, they're flying pretty close, which means yeah. that drones can probably provide more good than harm. And I think a lot of conservancy agencies just are so afraid of people flying drones. Frankly, it's unfortunate to say the least. I think we should go over one more story because this kind of fits right into koalas, conservation agencies using drones, and that is drones flying in national parks. And most recently, the there film, um, uh, The Free Solo, and yeah. how it seems like the guys who film Free Solo are trying so hard to backtrack that they didn't use drones in Yosemite, yet it seems rather clear that they did. What do you have for us? Well, it's an interesting story for sure. I mean, first of all, the documentary Free Solo is amazing. Now I've seen it, what, three or four times. Uh, I get sweaty hands every time I see that guy climbing the rocks. It's just, it's nerve wracking for sure. It's a very well shot documentary for sure. Uh, the footage is amazing. There are a few scenes, especially towards the end, that could have been shot with a drone. 
tech from a technical point of, uh, of view at least it could have been done by a drone however in all the interviews all the podcasts or the articles they deny having used the drone and they say that those last shots were done from a helicopter that flew so far away that alex honnold the guy climbing uh el cap in uh, yosemite park could not have seen or even heard that helicopter so they had a very long cannon lens up to i think a thousand mil um I would find that those. so hard to believe just because anyone who flies a drone with a long zoom, they know how much the camera moves when you're zoomed mm. in that far. A thousand millimeters is literally three times the length of a Z30. And I, I have never seen a helicopter pull off that shot smoothly, even it with would, the... It would be, yeah, it would be very tough to do. And of course, in post-production, you may be able to stabilize shots somewhat, but the, the shot is super, super smooth. It's really well done. What we did on our site is we uh, had a little survey asking our readers what they thought might have happened. And the majority of them actually do believe that it was shot with a drone. The people behind the, the documentary, of course, say no drones were involved. I mean, the only shots that they say it did include drones were the shots that were taken in Morocco, not in Yosemite National Park. Um, however, if you watch the documentary, at some points, uh, one of the camera crew people actually talks about the drone. And I'll give you the quote. This is uh, cameraman Shane Lempy saying that the worst possible scenario would be that uh, if one of us would do something that would kill him, being Alex Honnold, is it going to be the drone? Is it going to be one of the ropes? Is it going to be one of us accidentally knocking off a rock? And those are his exact words from the documentary. So it's interesting because they do talk about drones. Meanwhile, they say they did not use drones and it was shot by a helicopter. Um, at some point in the documentary, you see remote control, the type that you could use for drones. Um, they say that that was used for the remote camera that was mounted on the rock to film certain scenes of the, of the climbing. Um, I'm inclined to believe them. Um, was it a black however, remote, like a Ronin remote? No, it's not a Ronin remote. I didn't uh, see or remember the brands, but it's a different kind of control. The kind of control you would use for an Alta drone or an FPV drone, for instance. Gotcha. I'm inclined to believe them. However, it is interesting if you listen to that quote from the one cameraman, like why would he be talking about drones um, when they're climbing uh, in Yosemite? Bingo. Bingo. Yeah. So I don't know. Uh, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. Go If you haven't seen the documentary, go watch it. It's it's an awesome movie. It's, I think it's an hour and a half or so. Uh, go watch it. Let us know what you guys think. Uh, I thought it was great. And whether it was a drone or not, whatever. It's a great documentary. So go watch it. Definitely got to check it out. But also just want to let people know that for a long time, we've actually had the uh, NPS memo in the Drone Pilot Field Kit. If they go to dronepilotfieldkit.com, they can download it. Um, but recently, the NPS actually verified what we have been telling our students for the last four years, that as long as you take off and land from outside of a national yeah. park and fly in, it is totally legal, 100%. Yeah. And until they come up with some permitting process to actually allow drones to fly in there, especially when NPS has multiple drones flying inside parks anyway for conservatory purposes and mapping purposes yeah. and search and rescue, it's completely hypocritical. People are flying all day long anyway. Um, and I'd really love to see the NPS come up with some sort of permitting process and some sort of vetting process. You know, maybe they only let part 107 pilots fly. I think that would yeah. be a very easy fix. But we'll see what happens down the line. But hi, I really appreciate you coming on this show and showcasing all of these different news stories from around the world and brightening up my Friday morning as we talk about how Aussies are clearly winning the game of drones. They're totally ahead of us, man. Thanks for having me on the show. And uh, was, yeah, good seeing you again. Good seeing you as always, Haya. And if you're listening to the show, don't be afraid to leave us a review. Share the show with a friend. Who knows? It may give them a laugh. It may give them some valuable information. That's going to do it for us today. You're listening to another fantastic news episode of Ask Drone You. Ask Drone You.